Let's welcome in our first guest on the show, Sheriff Nate Harmon. Nate, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning. And uh, I thought we had, a, on a serious note here, the school shooting last week, and uh, another one, are way too many of these, obviously. Yeah. And I thought of you for a moment because of the work that you were trying to do with the local schools here in Berkeley County and through our elected officials and the delegation to increase security in the school system. I know that there's been money that's been appropriated to increase uh, security and safety in the schools with uh, upgraded doors, locks, mm -hmm. and such. And I know you also were looking for a way to get it funded so that we had more presence with deputies at the schools here in Berkeley County. How is that going? I, actually, it's going pretty well. Um, I know that uh, Dan Comer, his constituents with the Berkeley County Schools, is working closely with the regional school safety represent, representative uh, from the state where uh, the state's done an initiative where they've dumped about $2 million into uh, um, regional representation of state uh, school safety initiatives like see something say something or see something send something type of initiatives and then of course uh, threat assessments of the schools and, you know they all this you know we have I think I believe this regional um, uh, rep representative is former trooper uh, Kevin Plummer He's going around and visiting schools. He's got 93 schools to, to visit and uh, help them assess these things. So I can appreciate that initiative. At the same time, though, every district is different and uh, the needs are different. So, you know, we try to get more into the weeds uh, after a threat assessment's done. Where's the training gaps? Where's what the... does an assessment consist of? Well, a threat assessment can be something along the lines of uh, physical security. So areas that doesn't have what we call an observation uh, like trap area, so to speak, an access control point to where someone comes in, they get buzzed in versus freely allowed access to the whole building. There's still some older, um, situated buildings that doesn't necessarily have that uh, to some degree. Uh, you could go into, for example, the situation that had, happened at Sandy Hook in 2012, where uh, instead of having laminate safety glass, uh, there was tempered safety glass where, you know, you can have all the access control measures you need, but if the surrounding visually aesthetic glass isn't uh, up to standard or, or in terms of today's world, uh, and how these situations are evolving, uh, then it's fairly easy for someone to try to get in uh, by simply busting the glass. As we saw in the case of, of the Nashville shooter, mm. as awful as that was, she just mm. shot her way in. Which yes, is... which was surprising and, and, and scary at the same time because you want to learn from past events like Sandy Hook and whatnot. And ever since that situation, we've developed programs and have visited multiple locations to include workplaces and places of worship, um, schools and hospitals, and advocated for you know, safety laminate glass or locking mechanisms for doors that can't be now, When you say secured. safety laminate glass, you're not talking about ballistic glass, something that's going to stop bullets, right? No, 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 no. Now I'm talking about, so you have two types of glass. You have annealed glass, which is a heat-treated. A lot of commercial buildings have those. The problem with those is when they bust, they come off in big teeth. And the potential of that stuff flying inwards towards the rooms can cause a, a safety issue for those that are inside. I, um, so what I'm referring to, even though the annealed glass is harder, um, you know, laminate, uh, a, a film, if you will, a clear 3 mil, 9 mil, 10 mil laminate, sometimes you could mirror that or tint that. Uh, to some degree where you can see out, they can't see in, those kind of things. Oh, and apply that, uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, there's all kinds of things out there, clear armor and other things that try to tout ballistic capabilities. But just, you know, we, we try to recommend cost-effective ways to be able to do this. Some people refer to it as tornado glass. Uh, and, and that's where that comes from for folks that experience that, God forbid. But... It's a clear laminate and properly installed. If you have a nailed glass or tempered glass, it keeps the integrity of that glass. Doesn't stop the bullet, but it, it'll. There's videos out there. That it'll take significant amount of more force and time for an individual to try to gain access. I believe one video actually showed about 11 minutes 
uh, to try to bust a hole, you know, even the size of where someone could attempt to even crawl in. Um, even but with an AR? Huh? Even with an AR? Even with an AR. We've done... I've actually done a shot study with a single pane of glass uh, and showed a video where it shows annealed glass, rounds going through it. I shot it three times with an AR, three times with a um, nine millimeter, and uh, three times with an AK-47. And you go up there and you hit on it just like a windshield. Keeps its integrity. And, and think of it like a windshield, really. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the effect that you get. Doesn't stop the projectile, but it does keep the integrity of the glass. See, we talk about this as a former firefighter. I, I see people trapped in a burning building now. We have these windows that you can't get into, mm-hmm. which means that it's difficult to get out. But mm-hmm. I've, I've entered a number of buildings through windows when, when I needed to. So everything's a trade-off. It is. It, you know, it takes working closely with the fire departments and law enforcement to include EMS. I mean, there might be that, uh, that you know, requirement where you have that one window that's identified through the fire department uh, by various means with the buildings or some uh, code that exists uh, or that can be created where the one window is like your emergency exit or whatnot. Plus, technology is always is, is evolving, so it's... It, that, trust me when I say that uh, the fire department really, really enjoys destroying things. And uh, Yes, uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, when they got the jaws of life one time, I think they used it on my cruiser when they didn't really necessarily have to, but that totaled the car. Uh, it was fixable past that point, but uh, no, they, they've got tools and, and things capable of being able to get through that glass. It's, um, but it does take that relationship to, to come to the table and work on that. In regards to an expense of that nature, any idea what we might be talking about to retrofit a school with, let's say, the front doors and maybe all first floor ground level accessible windows? Um, well, are we talking millions, no, hundreds no, of thousands, tens no, of thousands? Pen- pennies on the dollar in terms of the the benefit. I mean, obviously, you cannot put nope. a, a price to a life, but we but we do. But we do. And the fortunate part is, is we've got, uh, and I'll speak for Berkeley County Schools, we are actively and proactively working and sitting at the table to be a lot more preventative in, in these areas. We've got exercises planned, full-scale exercises planned. We've got assessments being, threat assessments being done where it identifies various gaps in these buildings. And that's it. That It starts with a threat assessment. If you want to be cost effective, identify in your area, in your environment, how many windows ground level it needs up, upgraded. Um, where are my, so you could have a window at the front entrance and the front entrance is all secure except it's got a window in it, but it doesn't have security wire or meshing in the window. It's not even laminated, so, but it could be this small little single pane. It still could be shot out. Someone could reach in, they could unlock the door from the inside, stuff like that. Um, so it could be very uh, uh, low, and but you have to have a, uh, threat assessment to keep the costs down and to identify, all right, what are the priorities that I need to address first? And then they go, the threat assessment can even go into uh, emergency preparedness as far as training and whatnot. Uh, I'm Is this exclusively for staff and and faculty or is this, these exercises include kids too? It's for the staff and faculty with the recommendation uh, on how to train their younger audiences. So we equip, we can equip the the educators with uh, the information um, and they in turn translate that on how to relay it to their audience, whether it be high schoolers or fifth graders. Um, they know their audience best. I mean, I've, we can, t- it's no different than teaching drug awareness or fire safety with the kids. It's just something you gotta, there's certain things they need to know, certain things they do not need to know. We know that uh, historically, uh, those that wanna do bad things or those that are on a pathway to violence do their homework. Uh, they study, they watch videos, they, they train. Uh, they evolve with what they've seen in the past. How can I do it better? For example, the one in Tennessee, she wanted to be, you know, uh, one of the very few females to ever carry out an incident like this. And, you know, she had journals and she had uh, months worth of planning. And so our focus is be more on the preventative side of things, get parents to be parents, uh, be nosy parents, 
be involved with um, threat assessments. And when I say threat assessments, I'm not just talking about physical secure, physical security of building. I'm talking digital threat assessments. I'm talking these kids got Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. They got all these uh, uh, social media pages that can paint a pretty uh, good picture if you know how to do a digital threat assessment. There's programs out there. We are actively talking with the schools about these programs. I just had a meeting with uh, Deputy Superintendent Ron Branch um, earlier, um, well, it was over the phone, well, and in person too, uh, the week prior to last, yeah, uh, about these things so we're, we're actively engaged in talking about these things but like i've said before um you know i think we're we should start moving past the discussion part of it and start doing um, that's where i'm at now and that's where we're pushing the schools do we allow faculty to be armed in berkeley county i wish right. i not, wish I, i've advocated a guardian program with the schools i've actually sat down and talked with uh, Mr. Stevens and uh, Mr. Branch about these issues. Um, they have um, some concerns, but they're not closed-minded to the idea of it. They want to solidify a, 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 let's say, a program that is, um, uh, well, I've described it as the Guardian program. There's only three people that need to know who those armed folks are, that's the superintendent, prosecuting attorney, myself. Mm -hmm. Other than that, properly vetted folks that's got law enforcement, military, combination of both. That takes up to 160 hours worth of training that has volunteered for the position, a psychological background, a use of force continuum training class, and of course, weapons handling and safety. And it's a concealed carry position. No one knows who they are. I have... I don't want to name names or even even counties. One of my nieces is a school teacher in a, in a nearby county, and this run hide fight uh, rubric that, that they use. She is directed. She her classroom has direct access. There's a door. It's locked, but it, direct access to the parking lot. It's at a high school. Yet, if one of these shooters happens, she is directed to put all of her kids into this contained room to be sheltered as opposed to opening the back door and letting them run away. Mm. And I'm sure that this, this makes sense and I'm not asking you to take a position on, on the specifics, but it occurs to me sometimes that the, the threat assessment and the response needs to be not just school specific, but classroom specific, you know, to, and, and sometimes the risk of a, of a high school, high schooler getting away and skipping the rest of, of class is, is, is much better alternative than putting everybody into a single target space. Mm -hmm. Now I will take a position on it, John. I, I think you're exactly correct. Uh, they need to stop worrying so much about accountability and coddling these kids. I believe at, at one point, one of my girls uh, had stated that if she didn't get grabbed up into a room that she was advised to hide in a bathroom. Well, if you've looked at the open uh, floor plans of a bathroom in the schools where it's an open L shape and you go in there and you got the measly stall lock uh, to, you know, it's not a very secure place. Oh, put your feet up on the toilet so they don't see your feet under there. It, that is uh, so absurd. Um, and, you know, here, they want accountability. They don't, they don't have to sacrifice accountability as long as you're educating the kids on how to account for themselves. And aside from that, Run the opposite direction of where you see the threat is and, and um, get to a place of safety. That accountability can come later, uh, just like you said. It's, it's something that we need to definitely change the mindsets of a lot of folks, and that's ho what I'm in hopes of doing here, especially this year. Is there any light at the end of this tunnel? Do, are, there, are you aware of circumstances where potential shooters have, in fact, been stopped before they can do their damage it seems we're always behind the power curve yes and i i think we need to do a better job even on the media end of advocating those success stories uh i can't get into too much detail now but uh here locally we're or we've actively investigated a situation that uh had uh extremely high potential of becoming uh, a school involved uh issue um, we're cooperating certain things right now, and as soon as I cooperate those things um, through the investigation, you trust me when I say that I'll let the public know uh, exactly how uh, close we were to a situation. But um, think about Catactin High School, 2017. 
uh, where a young lady uh, in Frederick, Maryland, just 45 minutes from where we sit, roughly, a young lady wanted to be the first female to commit a Columbine-style high school attack. She uh, was arrested on March 23rd, I believe, um, at the school, and in her backpack was a book of Columbine High School, or I'm sorry, Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, and a search warrant on her closet yielded a sawed-off shotgun, all the munitions and pipe bomb-making material to carry out the attack. She was arrested March 23rd. Her attack date was April 4th. She, she was well inside a small window, uh, and here's what prevented that. Dad got into the room and saw her journal, saw the dark things that was really just very similar to the Tennessee shooting recently, the very dark things that she was planning on doing. She had went to the school resource officer and was specifically asking emergency response questions. Uh, she was doing her homework and uh, researching past events. How can I do it better? Dad handed the stuff over to uh, school officials and thank God between school and law enforcement, no one sat on that information and they acted quickly. And that's what we really need to do. We need to, if we find kids that, uh, and, and prevented anybody from dying, Right, and there's a there's a, 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 a stage, if you will, that we can better assess as individuals whether someone's in a fantasy stage, a planning stage, or implementation stage, where you know we can actually put a small blueprint to uh, better identify folks that are on a pathway to violence, and once we identify that, then we can get them pointed in the direction where resources can help them on the mental hygiene side of things. And I think that's where we need to be, and that's where the focus needs to be. So what happens to the, the child, the minor child, the teenager, the, the parents turn him in or turn her in? What then happens? Is the parent, it would be a very difficult thing to do, hmm. right, to sentence your own child to a ruined future. It's, it's better than the alternative in this circumstance. But does the child then face treatment or prison or what, what's the what's the next step when you head off one of these attacks when a parent calls in be, and, I, and I'm, I'm worried about my child doing this and it turns out those were the intent well one it, it, it depends on how early it's detected uh on whether or not they've approached a you know crossed the line into the criminal aspect of things there are evidentiary items that can point directly towards violent behavior, whereas the parents, the school, and resources within the county, mental hygiene resources, or potentially even substance abuse resources, um, that the family can be pointed towards and, and seek and be assisted with. Uh, we, they tr you try not to get into the court-ordered or mandated uh, issued rehabilitations, but Sometimes it does go that direction. So it's one or the other. Either the family gets more involved than, where, than when they ever was, uh, and they need to be, uh, and gets their child pointed in the right direction. With the, but I'm not a big fan of, of uh, medicine uh, to help somebody as much as I am this, this kind of personable conversations, mm -hmm. uh, but potentially medicines, but um, you know, court-ordered or mandated assistance as well is what what ends up happening so that young lady there uh at Catacton high school she was um obviously um detained and and sent to a psychiatric ward to where she's not thrown into a padded room for the rest of her life mm -hmm. she's actually getting some substance and help with her issues specifically her issues as opposed to a life sentence or or, yes. or yeah. death as a case right and that's where that's where we, we need to be with these things um, we need to be preventative with these things. We need to talk to the kids about reporting. And we talk heavily with adults, whether it be workplace, places of worship, hospitals, or schools, about how they can report. Uh, when Secret Service did a study, I believe I sent you, Rob, uh, some statistics on this. Secret Service did a study between you know, the Columbine High School shooting and, and, and the most recent uh, shooting, not the Tennessee one. But what they've come to find was some pretty scary numbers that 81% of the folks uh, that knew, and that's four out of five people knew, uh, of these concerning behaviors before the attack occurred. And most all of what fits the definition of an active shooter event. That's what they found. And then within that, not within that, but 93% of those situations um, 
you know, there was someone that uh, knew of the situation before it occurred, whether it be social media or um, some other um, avenue of, of uh, advertisement, either through, through a peer or whatnot. But 59% of uh, the incidences was where uh, those that committed the, the attack, 59% of those uh, folks, their friends knew about the individuals wanting to do something bad. Uh, so their peers, 59% of those instances were peers that had that prior knowledge. And we need to, we need to unscare folks from actually telling the appropriate authorities that this is concerning to me. Uh, I'd like to report it, but I don't want to you know, ruin my relationship with little Johnny here. Um, I, I, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to seem like a, you know, a, a tattletale. Um, I, I need to, you know, I want to report this anonymously, uh, but he's displaying, he or she is displaying concerning behavior. There has to be an anonymous reporting system. There has to be a confident uh, reporting system that folks can rely on, and we need to advocate that to our younger generation. And I think we also need to to unplug the zero tolerance uh meme that we have now that uh kids are expelled for drawing a picture of a gun or you know it goes to the to the extreme i project myself back into these these times i've got quite a few years on me but the kinds of stories i write now which are shoot them up mm -hmm. so those are the same stories that i was writing when mm -hmm. when i was writing in elementary school mm -hmm. um i i think i'm better now than i was then or the, but some might argue but you know we can't the, the extreme is to make kids so paranoid about First of all, daily life, and then whatever they think or they draw or they feel, and and um, I'm not sure there's a question in here. It's just my concern is that we've got a generation of kids who are constantly nervous, not just about their physical environment, but about what they're allowed to think and do and say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that what you have is you've had a knee-jerk reaction from uh, staff or those that have been charged with being responsible for these kids. And, and there's just been no focus on conflict resolution. Um, you know, you have staff that are either walking on eggshells and uh, have that knee jerk, uh, oh my God, you drew a pistol. Uh, and, you know, go off the cliff with um, this possible shooter or this, is, this person's done a really bad thing to uh, not doing anything at all. And so you got one extreme to the other. So us as managers leadership staff who are tasked with safeguarding these kids young adults are like uh, even the workplaces but there has to be a blueprint to start from right and that's where those assessments are so valuable i can't emphasize enough how uh, we've been talking about intermediary teams um, and uh, you know these threat assessments, whether it be physical threat assessments or digital threat assessments, how these things need to come together so we can we can eliminate these knee jerk reactions, so we can better assess, you know, uh, how to help these kids or, or young adults or the like. And this goes from you know not only schools but again churches, hospitals, and workplaces. Workplaces are the highest uh, volume of events. So again, we're 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 not addressing this on an early age, and they're 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 going up into these um you know conflicts in adult life and not knowing how to deal with them they think you know uh overreacting or, or acting out if you will is the answer because no one's taught them different or otherwise and so smithsburg uh maryland where you had that uh, shooting with co-workers he walked right in he asked specifically from his coworkers, yeah, I messed up on this machine part. And the guy looks at him and says, well, yeah, well, you probably, you, you can do better next time. He didn't make fun of the guy, didn't harp on him, didn't antagonize him for messing up a piece. But he just simply goes out to his car and gets a gun, comes back in and just starts shooting him. Um, obviously, there were some other underlying issues, uh, but um, that specifically is someone that's not filtering uh, social norms correctly. And... Um, you know, it's you know, that individual was from Hedgesville. He graduated Hedgesville High School. We did a search warrant on his house, and there was 22 weapons in his house. 
Um, you know, so it it's around us. It's here. And we all need to take a more proactive foot step forward, have candid conversations. You know, the sugar coating's done. We're, we're done with that. Um, and, and we need to have some very serious discussions. It's time to move forward. This August, we're going to have the first time ever an active, a full-scale emergency preparedness training exercise involving the educators, multiple agencies in law enforcement, fire and EMS uh, uh, on the southern, southern end of the county. Uh, I'm sorry, in July. Uh, July 26th and 27th will be the dates for that exercise. And I, I'm looking forward to a very good morning for law enforcement and a very good afternoon for educators because it's going to be a f- half and half. Our educators are going to be our role players. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have a, a very um, uh, a very good, fruitful uh, class on Beacon Active Shooter Emergency Preparedness Strategies, uh, talking to the educators in their classrooms at both these two locations uh, that we'll announce later, but uh, tr- teaching them in the classroom on how to better safeguard themselves in the classroom. Sheriff Nate Harmon has been our guest here in this segment. And uh, Nate, we are over time right now, but uh, quickly, I know when we had talked before, you had mentioned obviously getting a deputy in every school. You don't have 150 deputies to be able to do that. But we talked about retired military, retired police officers as on school security or at least enough so that the response time uh, for one person to get to one school or another isn't too elongated there. Any progress with that? Um, Actually, I have a meeting scheduled today. I believe he may have, there's some other things that came up, but uh, Delegate Hardy and I are are to sit down and have additional discussions. Uh, The floating SROs and additional uh, manpower in that regard uh, did not come to fruition during the session, but that doesn't mean the conversation has stopped. Um, we are looking at down the road uh, public safety uh, initiatives in terms of uh, uh, just doing town halls and talking with the public in terms of uh, we, you know when I first took office how many deputies we needed and to really be productive out there uh, you know when you talk about asking for 15 to 20 more deputies so you can fulfill these tasks because the state police is having their own grown pains in certain areas especially recruitment um, you know how do we better safeguard these these schools and these other uh, places where we do have these in-depth investigations that need to take place and take time? Uh, well, you need more deputies. And, and the, hands down, you have to have the manpower to be able to do that. Whether it's th- funded through the state or through the uh, county council, uh, regardless, the need has been we've, we've asked. Uh, we've brought it to the table. I think we've got some serious discussions to be had in the near future, but um, you know, more to more to to be said on that down the road. We're, we're not where I want to be yet, uh, but we're getting there. Nate, thanks for coming in today. Thank you very much, Sheriff Nate Harmon. 